Open your Bibles this morning to Psalm 50. It is true that everyone, every human being believes in God, or at least a God. Last week we talked about Psalm 23 and the necessity of the Christian being led by God and God alone. Yet saying we believe in God without knowing which God we really believe in is far more common and far more destructive than many of us realize. I'll say that again. Believing in God, saying we believe in God without knowing which God we really believe in is far more common and far more destructive than many of us realize. A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. He went on to say that, for this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous or deep fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he is in his, deep in his heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law to, uh, of the soul to move forward toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of individual Christians, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about, God, about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech, end quote. It is true that everyone, everyone believes in God. The issue is which God? We in America have gotten really good at this. We teach our children the Pledge of Allegiance, which says, quote, one nation under God. On our money, in our courthouses, above places in Washington, D.C., on our license plates, we inscribe this saying, in God we trust. Those are all good things, but again, we must ask, which God. The worship of God and the following of the one true God truly comes down to how you know him. It is a wonderful truth that God is both transcendent and imminent, meaning he's both far above us, far above what our comprehension can grasp, and at the same time, personal and close to us. So as we continue to consider where we are going as a church, we need to consider what we think about God. It's really easy and comfortable for everyone for me to stand up here and say, we are not taking God out of the church. Yay. Everyone's comfortable with that. Christians and non-Christians alike are comfortable with that. Simply believing in God is safe and following God is safe. Because everyone believes in God. God is safe until we start defining him. But there are some things about God that we have believed that we as a church at large need to remove. And there are some things as a church, as Christian people, that we have not said or left unsaid about God that need to start being said. So this morning, I'm going to do three things. I'm, I'm going to identify the unfortunate problem of humanity and Christianity in general. Then I'm going to give us the solution. And lastly, I'm going to supply us with a couple of implications. If that is true, if that is the solution, then what does that mean of me? What does that imply? So hopefully you have a copy of God's word. Let's look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50 is Psalm of Asaph. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge, Selah. 
Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought I was like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart, and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Amen. We can break this psalm up into four sections. The first one is uh, verse 1 through 6, then 7 to 15, 16 to 21, 22 to 23. The first section is God calling his people and indicting them. The Lord, the God, the, the Lord Almighty summons his people and calls them together. He doesn't just call the people. He calls all of creation, heavens and earth together to bear witness to what he's about to say. Verse 2, it tells us that God speaks from a place of perfection. His authority comes from his perfection, his perfect beauty. His power in verse 3 is summarized in what is always before him. It's an all-consuming, holy fire shrouded in tempests, meaning storms. Verse 6, Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, alone describes himself as judge of the earth. He, the judge, has called together the jury of the heavens and the earth, all of his creation, to witness his proceedings as he calls the defendant to be judged. Who are the defendants? Well, there, there are two, but they are one and the same. The defendants are those who proclaim the name of the Lord. For this trial or for this psalm, we're going to call them his associators, his associators, people that associate with God. Yeah, I belong to God. Yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I trust in God. Verse 7 to 15 speaks of the first group of his associators, this religious group. The first group is a religious group. God tells them it's not for their burnt offerings that they are being rebuked by the Lord. He says they are really good at doing that. They are really good at sacrificing animals unto him. They're really good about taking their animals to the temple to sacrifice. They're really good at being religious. And another way to say it to us today is they're really good at going to church. They're really good at wearing their church's t-shirt. They're really good about posting Christian stuff on Facebook. They look and play the religious part. But in verse 9, God says, I will not accept a bull or a goat from you. This is not a statement to where he will not accept sacrifice from them. He, it's not him saying he will not accept worship from them. He points to the reason through this very saying, to the reason that he is rebuking them. He says in verse 10 that every beast of the field is his. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All of the birds of the air are his too. He created them all. He sustains them all. He needs nothing because he is self-sufficient. The only God. 
He needs nothing. He's self-sustained. But that's the problem he has with them. Verse 12 to 13, the motivation of the hearts of the religious associators was that they believed, they believed God needed them to sacrifice. They believed that, they, that God needed them to keep up their religious ser- services. Their relationship was God, with God was purely mechanical. It was this type that we have to do this. We have to go to church. We have to do this. Or else, or else God just, I don't know, will not exist. If we don't do this, we won't have a relationship with God. But God tells them in verse 14, he tells them that their motivation is wrong. He, he's not hungry. He doesn't need your sacrifice. He doesn't need bulls and goats to be killed. He says in verse 14, he says, make, your thanks, make thanksgiving your sacrifice. Essentially, he says, you know, you know what's better than killing a bull? You know what's better than killing a, a, a goat? You know what's better than just coming to church? Performing the vows that you have made to me. Performing the vows you have made to me. Meaning, you've said when you took the covenant upon yourself, when you made an agreement with me, you said you weren't going to have any other gods other than me. You said you weren't going to take the name of the Lord God, Yahweh, in vain. You said you would keep the Sabbath day holy. You said you were not going to murder or steal or commit adultery, etc. Pretty easy, the Ten Commandments. That was what they said that they would do. That's the covenant that God made with them, and they agreed to that. And yet they weren't. The law can be summed up into two two pieces. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. They weren't doing that. This was mechanical. It was ritualistic. It was cultic. Essentially, he says, what is better than you killing or going to church for worship, killing a bull or a goat, or going to church for worship? You know what's better than making sure that these stained glass windows remain in prime condition? You know what's better than coming to church on Sunday, practicing what you preach. Now we move on to the second group. That's verse 16 to 21. This group is worse. He, he addresses them as the wicked. To the wicked, the Lord says. The first group doesn't seem to be immoral, at least. They're religious enough. They've got their act together on the outside. They have, they're, uh, they're just going through the motions. That, that's the problem. They're just going through the motions. The second group, though, they associate with God and live like hell. They associate with God, but they they call themselves Christians, but they live like hell. Verse 16, God says, the fruit that you bear, the things that I, I see, the things that people see, if they were to look closely at you, is that you recite my statutes and take my covenant on your lips, yet you hate discipline. They hate discipline. They hate the paideia of the Lord. They hate the waking up. They hate the afternoon. They hate the evening disciplines of remembering Christ, of reading the scriptures, of confessing their sins, of giving thanksgiving to God for all things. They hate all of that. Verse 17 says that God recognizes that they have no value of his word. You take, you take my word and then you throw it behind you. I once, heard, I once heard it said in this very room some three years ago, a woman professing to be a Christian once looked at me and said, since when did we get biblical? Meaning, since when did we start doing everything the Bible says? 
take the word of God and you throw it behind you. Has no value, has no meaning. That's not really what it says. Well, so, so many people can interpret it a different way. Last time I looked, the word of God was God breathed. It's profitable. We read this morning, Psalm 19. It's of much more value than gold, sweeter than the honeycomb. Verse 18, a fruit of their lack of love of God, their lack in their worship of God, their indictment against them is that they were okay with thievery and injustice. They saw no problem with associating with God, being a Christian, and telling adulterers and the sexually immoral, just keep doing whatever you want. It's, it's, it's what's going on right now with the United Methodist Church. They're ordaining homosexual men and women, LGBTQ, uh, element of P plus. They're, they're ordaining them and welcoming them as members into their church, saying, you just keep doing what you're doing. God loves you, and yet God's word says something very different. Verse 19 to 20, they have no control over their slanderous and deceitful evil tongues. And now we get to the core of the problem. Now we get to the root that has bore all of the fruit. Verse 21, these things they did, God said, but he kept silent. Any parents ever experienced this? There are times when I'll come upon my child and and or children doing something they know they shouldn't be doing and it's wrong and i observe them but i won't announce my presence i will simply stand and watch and and wait hope hoping hoping that they will stop doing what they're doing hoping that they will see what they're doing to be wrong before i have to say something that's the picture of god here God is being patient. He's not rebuking them. He's not doing anything about it. He's giving them time to repent. They knew his word. They were reciting it. It was was on their lips. It was right there. He's waiting for them to take hold of it and do it. Yet they didn't care. And in fact, that's their blunder. The second half of verse 21 says that they thought that God... This almighty God, the perfect God, the God that shrouded in storms of fire, they thought that this God, the great I am, they thought that he was like one of them. What an insult to God. They thought, hey, I've been sleeping with someone who's not my wife and God hasn't rained down fire and brimstone upon me, so it must be okay with him. Or, hey, I've been stealing, I've, I've been cheating, I've been, I've been lying, and I haven't been caught, and God hasn't killed me yet, and so I must be doing okay. They kept on sinning, thinking that God, the Almighty, the Holy One, the thrice holy, 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 that this perfect beauty of God was okay with their disgusting stain of sin. Here's the problem. Group number one, the the religious associators, thought that God needed them. They thought of God in a mechanical way. If, if If I do this thing, if I plug X in, then God gets what he wants, and in return, I will get what I want. And all will be hunky dory. Group number one thought this way, and group number two were hypocrites and liars. But yet both of them, both groups, the mechanical worship and the two-faced lifestyle, both of them come from the wrong thinking about God. So I told you I would address the problem and give you the solution. What's the solution? Well, if I were you, I would listen very closely because verse 22 says that if, you, if those of you who forget God don't listen closely, he will tear you apart. It's not someone saying that from their point of view. It's God saying that. God prophetically speaking through Asaph. If you don't listen, if you don't repent, if you don't turn your life back to, to me and call upon me, I will tear you apart. 
This is the judge's verdict. I will tear you apart. But being a merciful judge, he gives them the right to appeal. (laughs) What judge does that? Here's my verdict, but hey, I'm going to give you some more time to do the right thing. What a merciful God. Verse 23, God says the appeal or the solution can't be anything other than offering sacrifices of thanksgiving to God, calling upon him and ordering their life in the right way. God says the one who will see his salvation is the one who orders his way rightly. Now, what does that mean? It means that you submit your entire life to God. Paul follows up on this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He tells the church, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul's appealing to the people, present your bodies, your life, everything you are, present it to God as a living sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of religion, not the sacrifice of bulls and goats, not just simply doing the right thing, but living your life, every piece of it, unto the Lord, cognitively, decisively, this is God's. The solution is not to get more religious, it's to make God your life. The solution is to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Jesus told his listeners many times, Matthew 10, 38 and 39, Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. To take up your cross means to consider yourself dead. You, the person that you know yourself to be, you are dead. You don't exist anymore. To take up your cross means that you, all of what you think you know and what you think you should do or not do, should be put to death. Being a good religious person will not save you. And looking like a good religious person is even worse yet. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Follow Christ unto death. That means that yesterday you thought what it means to be the best and fullest me, the most excellent me, what you thought that that meant, or maybe just even an hour ago, what you thought that meant, maybe whatever, fill in the blank. And today, under submission to Christ, what you think to be the best and fullest you is to do the will of God. All right, pastor, what is the will of God? What is the will of God? If that's the solution, tell me, what is the will of God? Well, what what is it that God calls you to do? He tells people in Psalm 50, order your life rightly. I'm gonna give you a number of verses to bring this to light in the the church age as God speaks to his people with the Holy Spirit. Paul tells the church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, This is the will of God. Their ears go up. What is it I'm supposed to do? This is the will of God. Your sanctification. He says it to the Romans in this way, in Romans 6, 19. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. We all have this natural limitation. We... We, uh, many of us, the, the 50% of, uh, of uh, Americans have a, a reading level, an interpretation level of a seventh grader. Nothing wrong with that. It's just, it is what it is. We have natural limitations as humans. I'm speaking to you, he says, for just as you once presented your members, uh, the members of your body as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, you presented your life to lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Well, what is sanctification? Sanctification is being set apart. 
It's being made more holy. Sanctification is becoming less like the world and more Christ-like. The author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, 14, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. How is it? How is it that you get to God? How is it that you get to God beyond that shroud of fiery storms of holiness? With holiness. You can't approach him without holiness. And here's the hammer that drives the nail in. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God has shown us his love in this, that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for sin, for all of the sins of the world. He loved us by raising him from the dead. He loved us by causing him to appear to us with a message. Those of you who believe will have their sins forgiven. Those of you who follow me will be my disciples. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead? If so, which that is the crux of Christianity, right? That is what it means to be a member of the body of the church. That is what it means to be a Christian, is to believe that Jesus died for your sin, that you can be forgiven by the blood of Christ, and to, and to believe that Jesus rose from the dead to new life and is going to return one day and judge your soul. If you believe that, there are some implications as uh, there are some implications that that should lead to. What's implied in this? So we move on to the third part. I told you I'd give you the problem, the solution, and some implications of that. All of the implications can be wrapped up in one statement. All of the implications. All the implications of it can be wrapped up in this sentence. Live like it. You say you believe it, so live like it. If I can sum up Psalm 50, if I can, if I can be so bold as to sum it up, I'd sum it up like this. There are Christians, and there are Christians, and then there are Christians. There are people who call themselves Christians but are re really just going through the motions. They're a religious type. Then there are other Christians who look like Christians on the outside but live like hell the rest of the 160 some odd hours of the week. And then there are Christians who follow Christ, order their lives rightly. What does it mean to order your life rightly? It means to put Christ first and you're under him. Christ is Lord. Not everyone who associates with Christians or calls themselves a Christian is a Christian in the eyes of God. Richard Dawkins, uh, a leading scientist in the world and a leading atheist in the world for the last 30 years is well and highly known. For the last month, that, or for the last 30 years, he's been highly known as this atheist, staunch atheist against God. And in the last month, get this, he told reporters that he was a cultural Christian. <laughs> if that doesn't make you sick, there's something wrong with your spirit. He's a cultural Christian? The atheist. The atheist who believes there is no God. He's a cultural Christian. In fact, that is what this psalm is saying. That's what God is saying of these two groups in this psalm. They are, at best, cultural Christians. Saying they're, they're believing there is a God, saying that there is a God, and living like hell. See, many of us have the idea that the Christian life is summed up in this. 
I read some scripture from time to time. I come to church on Sunday. I give some money to the church. I give some money to the food bank. I say my prayers before I eat. And when I die, I will go to heaven. My friends, I think if you believe that way, you're going to wake up surprised where you are after death. This is not the Christian life. The Christian life is to have your mind changed by God, to have your mind changed about God, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul said that this is the will of God for you, to be sanctified. Many, many of us Christians get this, this wrong, get it out of order. James, Force, or James uh, says, don't be a hearer of the word only, but a doer also. Right? Don't just listen to the word, but go and obey it. Many of us start doing before we even hear, like we know what we need to do, and yet we don't actually know what we need to do. So many people say things like this, I need to be a better mom. I need to get up at 5 a.m. and be the Proverbs 31 woman to prove myself acceptable to God. Many men think, I need to get up and go to men, more men's Bible studies. I need to be at more men's events to prove that I'm a Christian man. But that's not the will of God for you. You've started acting before you actually heard what God has said. God didn't say that that's his will for you. God said that the will of God for him, the will of him for you is sanctification. To be drawn near to him. To be transformed by his spirit. The will of God for you is that you come closer to him. Remember David? Audience of one. We should come to this place where we say, it doesn't matter what you think about me. I follow God. In fact, there are many of you that, that say something even more prideful. You're not following God. You say, I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I don't really care what you think about it. It says, rebel rousing against God. I don't care what you think about me because I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going this way. Instead, we should be saying, I don't care what you say about me because I'm pursuing Christ. I am pursuing holiness. I am going after God. Psalm 50 says that God is pleased when you call on him in your day of need. That he is pleased when you give thanks in all circumstances because you know he is God. The will of God for you is to listen to his call, to heed his call, to come closer and closer to him, to die to yourself and come to Christ, to come to God. You will get to God through that shroud of fiery tempests. You will get to him as the good shepherd is the only one who can pass through. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So are you holding the hand of Christ and following Christ as he leads you to God? As he moves you to God, are you following him? Are you his are you the sheep that know his voice? We have to also be careful because we can get into this sort of academic state where we just seek the knowledge of God for the knowledge of God. So that we can come to know him in a mechanical way to where we can win things like Bible trivia. This isn't why we want to come to know God. We want to come to know God. We want to know him more because we love him and we are committed to him. We've made a covenant to him. We want to see it through. He's worth it. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of us to call upon him as the Lord in our day of need, not just for our religious wants, not just so that we can look good. So under the care of the elders, Providence Christian Church will seek nothing more than this. Listen, you don't need to be here on Sunday morning to be a statistic for our attendance record. You don't, we don't need you here to give money just to keep the lights on. We don't need anyone to do more Christian-y stuff 
We don't need one certain type of music. We don't need one more order of service, one, one, one certain type of order of service, etc. What we need is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one body unified in Christ. That's what we need. Unified in Christ, exalting Christ above everything. What we need as elders and as Christians to join together and do to do is to exalt Christ above everything we do. We need to proclaim week by week. I need to call you to proclaim that Jesus is Lord, to preach and teach to you that Jesus is Lord. And I need to call you to obey that. The same for you. You need to call me to obey Christ. We need, we need to teach you to call upon the, the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins day in and day out. We need to teach you to call upon the blood of Christ to purify your life from all of its ailments and wickedness. We need, to call, we need to call you, we need to teach you to, to call upon the name of the Lord to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We need to thank Jesus in the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the service, and in the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the week. We, we need, as a church, and we as elders, are going, going to seek that Jesus Christ is seen and heard and sensed and understood and most of all, desired. Desire. I pray for you to have a desire, a desire to follow Jesus. You could be walking a Christian faith that's as crooked as some of these country roads out here. But as, do you have a desire to follow him? Do you have a desire to be with him, to know him, and to know him more? So we say, let the mega churches have the cool lights. Let the stale and dying churches have their list of traditions to keep. Let the worldly churches, if, if I can call them that, if I can call them churches at all, let the worldly churches have their inclusions and acceptance of all. We as elders say, let them have all of that. Our desire here as a gathering of people at Providence will be and will be pursuing Christ. We are pursuing the word made flesh. Let us eat of him through his word. Let us drink of him through communion. Let us do all things, all things to his glory alone. Amen? Father, I pray that you would continue to watch over us as a group. This is easier said than done. I ask God that you would lead us that you would give us the power to obey, to hear your word and to obey, not to live like hell, but God, to see our life purified through Jesus, to see our hearts be content with Christ alone. Father, that you would flow, the, that, that out of our worship would come a flow of, of eternal rewards, God, that people's lives would be changed because you are seen and heard and sensed here and desired here at Providence. Father, we pray that you would lead us and that you would do this through your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.